Okay, 296. Saturday night at 6. 42 party? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Forty two party Saturday night. Sir. 6 p.m. Right. He thought I was going to make that announcement. Remember to pray for those that are on our prayer list. Continue to pray for the uh, family of Gordon Priest. Yesterday, Stephen Bill and then Brown Road. I got something I want to say about that too. I appreciate the preaching of that people. I, I don't know either one of those preachers. I'm assuming they were they were Baptist preachers. I, I think that Alan and Dora were Baptist. And, uh, but I, I appreciated the preaching. They, they, they reminisced a little bit and told some stories, which is right and good. But then they took us straight to Calvary, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And uh, also, remember to pray for the family of Ann Thorne. She passed away last night. And a member of our church and the funeral arrangements or any of that stuff haven't, haven't been decided yet. We can be in prayer for Richard and the rest of that family. Also, Brother Frank.
Frank Gaten starts new treatment tomorrow in, uh, in Irving. And so you'll be in prayer about that. And I think that's all that. Just remember to pray for the rest of these that are on our list. Do we have anybody we need to add today to the prayer list? Yes, ma'am. I would say that's surgery in the morning, and you could have some things checked out. I just want to be good for us to just pray for all students that are trying to go back to school. Uh, they go back to school and pray that they can be the bright, shiny Christian life that they should be. It would be good for us to pray for some teachers and students. <laughs> At least that was the case when I was in school. I don't know about <laughs> Last week or two, I've been saved for 25 years. Amen. Amen. And, uh, while I've made lots of bad decisions and lots of bad choices in my life, I'm sure some people will be happy to stand up and testify to that in the church today, but we ain't got time. <laughs> while I've made lots of bad decisions, I have never regretted that choice that I made that night. Amen. 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 I got saved the same night as that did. Before you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I had no idea it was going to be up here. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Bible says, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevailed nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. You may be seated. As Jesus makes his way into the city of Jerusalem for this last Passover feast, by the way, we're only about halfway through the Gospel of John, but we're already narrowing down on the final week of the Lord here. And Jesus makes his way into the city, and we see a crowd has formed around him. Actually, it's several smaller crowds coming together to form a larger crowd. There were those who had been in Bethany with Lazarus and the family and Jesus when Lazarus came forth from the grave that had followed him up to Jerusalem. There were the resident Jews that lived in the city of Jerusalem. And then also there was a great number of people that had come from all over and had come to Jerusalem for the observance of this Passover feast. Verse 13 tells us that this crowd took palm branches and waved them before Jesus as he rode into town. These palm branches had become a Jewish symbol of victory in uh, recent history at this time of Israel. It was back during the Maccabean period, I'm talking about that time that took place, some of that time that took place in the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that Maccabean period, Israel, about 150, 200 years before this event here in our text takes place, Israel had actually won their independence as a nation in that time era. And they took those palm branches, history tells us, and they waved them as a sign of victory as the victors marched into Jerusalem. On this day, in our text, they were declaring victory in Jesus. But can I tell you this morning, it's not the kind of victory that we sing about, victory in Jesus. They were declaring victory not over sin and death and hell and the grave, but they were simply declaring victory over a tyrannical rule of the Roman government. They thought Jesus was come to set up a kingdom where Israel would be exalted and Rome would be kicked out of the office, or off the throne, you might say. In fact, this was a very remarkable day for any Jew or Jewish people who might carefully be paying attention to God's prophetic calendar. Because it was about 500 years before this day that a prophet by the name of Daniel wrote a prophecy, you'll find it in Daniel chapter 9, it's known as Daniel's 70 weeks. And in Daniel's prophecy, he tell you, it's, kind of a, it's kind of hard to cipher out, but you'll get there if you look at it. He uses one, uh, 
one week that equals seven years is what it boils down to. And he divides his prophecy up into three time eras. The first is, is uh, seven weeks or 49 years is what that has to do with. And it covers the time from the time, it, it tells us in Daniel chapter 9, you can study it for yourself, that uh, those 49 years cover the time from when it was, it was first the decree went out to have the temple rebuilt. You'll find that in Nehemiah chapter number 2 all the way until basically through the end of the Old Testament. 49 years. And then there's another section of time in Daniel chapter 9 that he calls 32 weeks. 32 weeks are 434 years. A time era that would span through the silent years between Matthew and Malachi, or Malachi and Matthew, all the way through the earthly ministry of our Lord. And, uh, and, 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 and here we are, you take those 434 years plus the 49 years prior to that, and here they are in the text, we are in the text, 483 years, Years from the time that the decree had been given to rebuild the temple, 483 years, and Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem. Now I'm going somewhere, so just hang in there with me. The Jews seem to have forgotten something about that prophecy. First of all, Daniel's prophecy, when you read it in Daniel chapter 9, clearly states that the Messiah would be coming in 483 years for this purpose, to finish the transgression, to make an end of iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteousness. His Prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, at the end of the 483 years, this is what it says, shall Messiah be cut off. The Jews were leaving out this part about how Jesus was going to have to die to pay for our sins. And they just, they just missed, skipped over that part. But something else they skipped over too, Daniel's prophecy covered a 490 year period, not a 483 year period. What about those last seven years? That 70th week, what about that? We know that to be the tribulation period when Israel and this world will go through much tribulation after the saints have been raptured out of here and then the, and then the kingdom will be ushered. But here they are in our text, only 483 years into the prophecy, and they're expecting Jesus to usher in the kingdom on this day. I said all that to say this, they weren't too worried about their victory over sin, just the victory over Rome. They, they were concerned about uh, their life as it was, uh, in that day. The Jews wanted to skip to the end of Daniel's 70th week, but they missed the Messiah. They missed the real victory in Jesus that He had come to save us from our sins, to forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to save our souls from hell. They missed that point. A few lessons to learn in Jesus' triumphal entry, as it is called in my Bible. A few lessons to be learned. First of all, the true victory is not political, it's propitiational. Jesus is our propitiation. The Jews missed the part where the millennial kingdom of God would be built upon the foundation of a spiritual kingdom. 
Now we can certainly understand why that they were so anxious to get the kingdom of God and the, uh, the kingdom that would exalt Israel on this earth. We can see why they were so anxious to get down to this. They, like we do, knew that the hand of the devil in the nations is very evident. They could see the hand of Satan in their midst and in their nation. Rome ruled with violence and intimidation. Taxation was corrupt and oppressive. The government was reinforced by a ruthless army. If your child wandered out into the streets where the uh, Roman army was prancing through on their horses and got in the way, it was nothing for them to just stomp right over a kid. The Roman crucifixion was a terror to society. Death was a form of sports entertainment in Rome. The hand of the devil was obvious. Evil was abounding in their nation. Let's think about America today. Our tax dollars fund a government that is corrupt as it, as it can be. Death is an industry. If you don't believe that, look up the works of Planned Parenthood sometime. Sex is an obsession. Materialism is a god. I'm kind of looking forward to the Millennial Kingdom myself, aren't you? Not only that, but they knew that the principles of the Word of God was good for civil government. If we could just get a leader or leadership that would institute and uphold good laws, then surely life would be better. We can understand that. As Americans can. There's a problem with that. You've heard the saying, and I believe it's true, you cannot legislate morality. You can make all the laws you want to about a gun. You can outlaw a gun. And I'll tell you, if somebody wants to kill somebody, they'll kill them. If they set their mind to do it, they'll kill them. Cain didn't need no gun to kill Abel. You can't legislate morality. And then on top of that, earthly leadership is temporary. It had not been that long since Israel had waved palms of victory for their independence before. And now here they are again under the rule of the Roman government. If Jesus was just another king on this earth, they had to have asked themselves, how long will victory last? You can think about the leadership in America. I don't, I'm not trying to get political, but you pick any man you want to and put it in your mind, and he's only got, he's only got four years before potentially he's going to be out of there. It's only got four years to try to turn things around. I'll tell you something. America is so messed up. There's not one man. There's not one Congress. Or there's not one judiciary system or executive branch that can, that can fix all of our problems in four years. What is it that creates real and lasting and good change in a nation? It's not... Politics, friends, it's revival. That's why we're praying for revival. It's people trusting in Christ. America needs Jesus Christ. Not the politician, but the eternal Savior. The victory is not in the continuation of America or some set of ideals that you may hold, but victory Victory is found in Jesus Christ when He died for our sins and then He rose again in victory over death and the grave and
and has given us a place in heaven if we will repent of our sins and trust in Him. That's a big prayer. Brother, brother, brother. Number two, something I see in this text. Victory is not in the miracle, but in the man, Christ Jesus. Verses 17 and 18, the people therefore that were that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record for this cause. The people met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. This goes back to John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And here were these that, that were there that could bear record of the fact that there was a miracle done. But if all you see is the miracle of John chapter number 11, then you've missed the victory in Jesus. The devil used this miracle to produce a celebrity. And I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Lazarus. If you go back to the end of chapter 11, they wanted to kill Lazarus too because they were afraid it was going to draw too many people away. Lazarus, and of no fault of his own, but he had become a celebrity. Some had misplaced their interest in that they were interested in what happened to Lazarus. Not only that, but the devil used this miracle to produce a false hope. Just because Jesus had worked this miracle for Lazarus, I wonder if some had put their faith in the, in the thought or in the hope that Jesus would do the exact same thing for them. Can I tell you this morning that just because Jesus worked a miracle for Lazarus and in his life didn't mean he was going to do it for everybody. Some had misplaced their faith in the miracle instead of Jesus. Verse 19 caught my attention. Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye, how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. They said, hey, because of this miracle, everybody's believing in Jesus, but the reality of it is they had not all gone after Jesus. They were interested in the miracle that took place. How do you know they weren't all getting saved? Because this same crowd that's crying Hosanna in the next few chapters is going to be crying crucify him. Victory is not in the miracle, but in the man, Christ Jesus. We've all heard testimonies of how God miraculously healed or delivered some person from something, some oppression, and perhaps they even become somewhat of a local celebrity because of the work that God has done in their lives. But can I tell you this morning that when you come to terms with your sin and your need of salvation and a Savior lest you die and go to hell, it's not someone's miracle that captivates your attention. It's the fact that God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. It's the fact that Jesus came to die for your sins and to wash you whiter than snow. The only miracle you're interested in when Jesus comes to save your soul is the one where Jesus takes a black heart of sin and washes it in red blood and it comes out whiter than snow. When you're wanting to get saved, the only thing you're interested in is Jesus. We've seen God do things in other people's lives and we know that He can if He wants to. If it's His will, we know He can do it for us. For what God has done for others, He can do for you. We know He can but we also understand
understand the reality, sometimes he doesn't. He'll bring healing in one family, but not in another. He'll bring victories of some kind in one family, but not in another. That's part of the sovereignty of God. That's part of the will of God. The secret things belong to God, the Bible said. But when we're wanting to be saved, we're not interested in what the Lord might or might not do. We're only interested in what He's already done. When he died on the cross and made a way for sinners to be saved. The story of Lazarus being raised from the dead is a great story and a great testimony of a true occurrence. But if Jesus had never raised Lazarus from the dead, he'd still be God. There would still be victory in Jesus over death and hell and the grave because Jesus is more than a miracle worker. He's the Savior of the soul. Yeah. Victory is not in the miracle. It's in the man. Number three, victory is not in the press of people but in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of this crowd had been with Lazarus and his sisters and Jesus in Bethany. And yet some of this crowd were lost and on their way to hell. How could that be, preacher? They had been hanging around with Lazarus. They had been hanging around with people who said, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that thou art the resurrection and the life. They've been hanging around with faithful people. Can I tell you this morning, hanging around with the saved person doesn't make you saved. There may be some here today that think you're on your way to heaven just because your mama's saved and your daddy's saved and your grandma's saved and, and, and your Sunday school teacher's saved. Let me tell you something. There comes a time when you need to, when you have to uh, address your own sin and admit your own sin before God and trust Him to be your Savior. Victory was not in being part of this great celebratory crowd. It was waving palm branches and crying Hosanna. That's not where the victory is. I wonder how many people today think, think that they are saved just because every Sunday they pile up in a church full of people that singing praises to God and testifying about His grace. Being in the crowd is not going to save you. Being in a certain church is not going to save you. You're not going to sneak in to heaven with God's people unnoticed. Jesus knew. I thought about that lady that had an issue of blood. She came and found Jesus in the great press and throng of people. And Jesus knew her out of a whole crowd of people. I'll tell you something. He knows you too. He knows who's saved and who's not saved. You're not going to slip in. In a big crowd. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He needs to be your Savior. By the way, if you trust Him today, it will be the best decision you ever make. Because no matter what the crowd does, He'll still be your Savior. Let me close with one more thought. The victory is not so much about what happens in the circumstances of this life right now. But real victory is what's waiting for us in eternity. Amen. You'll notice in the text that they were crying Hosanna. Interesting word. It literally means come and save us now. Save us now. 
There's a sense of urgency to the word Hosanna. It's not just, just, just save us whenever you want to, Jesus, but save us now. Let me remind you that God has a rapture waiting for all of those that are saved when He comes in the clouds and we go up to meet Him in the air. And God has a 70th week for the nation of Israel here on this earth. But you'll notice in this Bible prophecy that He put a space between the 69th and the 70th week. A big long space. How long? Well, so far it's over 2,000 years between the 69th and 70th week. We call it the church age. A time where we toil and we struggle along in this world you say, preacher, it's bad in this world. I agree with you, it is bad until you look at it in light of the things on God's timeline. It's bad until you look at it in light of that 70th week that's coming. On this earth when after the saved have been raptured out, those that are left behind go through tribulation and trouble like this world has never seen. There's victory in Jesus because we're going to be raptured out of here before that happens. It's bad on this earth until you look at it in light of eternity in heaven with Jesus because I thought about what the Apostle Paul said. He said, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding weight of glory. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I want you to know, if you'll turn to Jesus and trust Him to save you from your sin, He'll save your soul now. Now, immediately. But I also want you to know I can't promise that your life is going to be all easy and comfortable after you get saved. There's troubles and trials that come our way. We toil and struggle along in this life. But one of these days, the saved of God will enter into heaven. No pain, no sorrow, no death. Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Oh, death, where is thy victory? Thanks be unto God who always giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're lost today without Christ. What you need to be saved, what you need to have victory in Jesus is not found in politicians. What you need is not going to be found in a miracle of healing. What you need is not going to be found in a crowd of people. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. Why don't you trust Him today and be saved? It'd be a good day to get saved with Him. We're going to stand and sing a verse of invitation.